Bible says, turn there. Then let's stand for the reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 21. Stand and read. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll get that out of the way. Once again, thank you for being here tonight. Here in Matthew chapter 21. The Bible says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, verse 1, and were come to Bethany, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village over against you. Straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. Straightway he will send them. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and scrawled them in the way. The multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he was come into the Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? The multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. Galilee. Father, we shall love you tonight. I pray that you would use your word in a special way. Tonight I pray that you would guard me, Father, from saying anything that you have me not say. Father, I pray that you give to me of my thoughts and fill me with your thoughts tonight. Amen. I may preach to your people. Father, thank you for your love and thank you for your guidance and direction in our lives. Help us tonight. Use this to motivate us, challenge us this upcoming week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. One of the most dramatic events in human history, I'm about to say biblical history, human history is about to take place. Here we have Jesus Christ, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem where he is presented, if you will, king of the Jews. This is the setup, if you will. The set, this, this, this event right here set the whole plan in motion that Jesus Christ was speaking of. Uh, before, when he talked about in chapter 16, and that's what we've been looking at in chapter 16, where he says, from that, that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. To set this in motion. Jesus Christ coming in as a king would. Yet instead of a king coming in on a stately horse, he comes in on a donkey. He comes in meek and lowly. Yet the people, for some reason, began throwing palm leaves and, and leaves and, and covering the ground that he covers. And they began lifting him up and, and crying out, Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, they saw him as a prophet. The prophet from Nazareth. But they were professing him as the son of David. And David was the, the kingly line. Literally, they were saying, Blessed is the, he that cometh in the name of the Lord, the son of David, the king. He's coming. Here he is. Now, remember, we're talking, he's, he's teaching his disciples. He's, he's got less than a year before he's going back. At this point, he's, he's within weeks away of his crucifixion. And he's here, and he's, he's coming in. And remember, his disciples are still struggling with this idea of him setting up his earthly kingdom right now. And not sometime later, but right now. He, he's, he's struggling. They're struggling with this. Well, why do I know that? Because in the passages just before this, they're asking who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. And, and then James and, James and John, the son of Zebedee, are asking, their mom comes and asks him, 
Can my son sit on your right hand and on your left hand in thy kingdom? So they have this mindset that Jesus Christ is setting up his kingdom right here and right now. Well, he continues on. After he enters Jerusalem, and I, for the sake of, of you, each one of you standing, uh, he immediately enters the temple. Here in verse 12, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple. Now, this is the second time he's done this. And overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said to them, it is written, my house will be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame, it's kind of funny, now we talked about this morning. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hast, uh, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethlehem, and he lodged there. Uh, here we have this, this beautiful picture of Christ being brought into uh, Jerusalem. Now, once again, it's his last time entering into Jerusalem. That from going there, he's going to be crucified and laid to rest in, in the garden there in the tomb. This is the last time he's entering into Jerusalem, and he's being presented as, as king. Then he goes immediately into the temple and begins cleansing the temple. These two events, you don't talk about causing a stir with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the religious leaders. Not just them, but it's giving them cause to go to the king at that time and say, Oh, king, did you hear what they're saying about him? He's the son of David. Which means he's king. They're lifting him up as king. Do you hear all the people? They can begin questioning <laughs> Jesus Christ. Do you hear what they're saying? Jesus, do you hear what they're saying about you? Aren't you going to stand up and deny this? He says again, have, have you not read? Come out the babes and sacrament. Literally, he says he's questioning their authority of, of knowing the scriptures. Uh, remember, they're, they're, they're proud of their uh, humility. They're proud of their ability to know the law and to give the law to those around them and to make them uh, seem bigger in place of, of all the, if you will, normal believers. He says, have you not read that thou hast perfected praise and left them and went out of, the, out of there? Now, as I was looking and reading through this, he's then coming back into the city the next day. We have the story of the fig tree, the barren fig tree here. As I was reading through this, I began working on my heart and life and talking to me about what made him what, if you will, what he was trying to teach me through it. But maybe it might have been something he was trying to teach the disciples through this passage, through these scenarios that are going on. But recognizing that we, as, that me as a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, I need to learn and need to be focused on exactly what he was teaching the disciples. Uh, knowing this was the last time he's going to teach them anything. And when he taught them, he taught them through parables, but he thought, taught them through uh, real-life events that he allowed to happen in his life to teach them how they ought to leave once he's gone. He's recognized, he's preparing them. I'm about to leave you, and I'm about to leave the, 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 the charge of, of giving the gospel, the charge of... of Continuing the church. I'm about to leave these men in charge of that. They need to be prepared. They need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. He goes on and he's coming back into Jerusalem the next morning. He says, now in the morning, he returned into the city. And as he returned into the city, he hungered, showing his humanity. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon. But leaves only and set it in. Let no fruit grow on the henceforth forever. Presently the fig tree withered away. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? 
Uh, at this point, I'm wondering, how are they still marveling over things that Christ did? How? I mean, have you not seen what he's been doing? I mean, he's, he's healing blind. He's healing the lame. He's causing all these things to happen immediately. And you're, you're marveling. You are amazed over the fact that he, he caused this, this plant to wither away. Shouldn't that be something they would have expected? I mean, if he's going to curse the fig tree, it's going to wither away right away. But no, they marvel. Once again, almost like they were surprised. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree wither away? Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also... If ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. When it was coming to the temple, once again, this is the whole scenario of being brought into Jerusalem. He goes into the temple, cleans it out. Then he goes, and oh, just overnight, he stays in Bethphage, and then he comes back the next morning. And he goes right back into the temple. And when he was coming into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? Who gave these the, who gave thee this authority? Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing. Which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Which was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned within themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not then believe him? But if we say of men, <coughs> we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. They answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Jesus Christ stops them. You know, he puts them in a, in a bind. Remember, they're already upset. They're already aggravated. How dare this man come into town promenading as king? How dare he walk into our temple and start throwing over the tables and cleansing out the temple and calling us the den of thieves? How dare he come back the next day and begin teaching in the temple? How dare he? Who does he think he is? Who do, you, who do you think you get your authority by? And boy, did he put it to him. Well, I'll give you an answer if you'll answer my question. Uh, the baptism of John, who, who was it by? Was it from heaven or, or of men? Remember, John is the one that proclaimed, there he is. The man in whose, whose shoe lasts, I'm not even worthy to die. The prophet, the great prophet that preached the coming of Jesus Christ, uh, and, and he kept preaching, he's coming, he's coming. And then he said, there he is. The Pharisees have a dilemma here. Now I want you to understand, the disciples are watching all this happen. Wouldn't you have loved to just be a fly on the wall and watch these Pharisees squirm? When they came back together and began raising together, which we say it was of heaven, then he's just going to say, well, why do we not believe him? Because John proclaimed him to be Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So if we say that, then he's going to say, well, why don't you believe me? And then what are we going to say? But if we say, on the other hand, oh, man, if we say it to men, then you know what? Then the people will turn against us because they believe he's a prophet, the true prophet of God. Oh, man. They're put in a position where they're going to have to make a choice, so they make the only choice they can. We can't tell you the answer to that. I love Jesus' response. They need to tell you about what authority I do this. If you can't answer this question, because you know the truth, you're not willing to answer this question. That's basically where he puts it. But I want you to understand, everyone is watching at this point. You have the people of Jerusalem watching. You have the disciples watching all these events. But not only that, you have the Pharisees and Sadducees. You have them all <coughs> watching and standing and, and just amazed by what's going on. All that's going on. 
God taught me a couple of things you know, that I believe he wanted me to share with you tonight. First off, I want you to see that all will be fulfilled. Yes. Every last jot, every last tittle, every last period, every last dot of the eye, every T will be crossed. Everything from God's word will be fulfilled. Amen. Can I tell you, as a disciple of Jesus Christ in that day and age, you know, yes, I've got my mind is set. I love to put myself in their shoes. My mind is set that, hey, I'm going to be, uh, we're about to set the kingdom. Look, he's coming into Jerusalem as king. Meek and lowly, but he's coming in as king. And they're crying, Hosanna to the son of David. They're recognizing him as king. Yes, it's true, it's happening. But I want you to understand, I, I'm, I'm recognizing, as the scripture says in verse 4, all this was done. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Well, I started questioning, well, what prophet was that? In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, is where he's quoting from, where we're quoting from here. He says in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt. The foal of an ass. Literally, in Zechariah, God gave the prophet, prophet Zechariah, this, this foreknowledge that Jesus Christ was going to come into Jerusalem and he was going to be riding on a donkey and he was going to come and they were going to rejoice and they were going to shout and bring salvation with him. Jesus Christ was the total fulfillment of the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament pointed to one day, one event, and that was the fact of Jesus Christ coming to this earth. Yes. And here, the disciples needed to understand, no matter what you're thinking, wherever your mindset is right now, everything in the Word of God that you have learned, that you have heard of, I, we are fulfilling it right here and right now. But can I tell you the truth tonight? Praise the Lord. I can believe that everything in God's Word will be fulfilled for me as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a disciple today of His. Everything in His Word will be fulfilled. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also would sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them. Yes. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the calling of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout of the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Can, folks, do you believe it tonight? All will be fulfilled. Amen. He's Amen. coming again. Amen. He's coming to take us home. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, Christ is trying to teach them, look, I am the fulfillment. All that we say, all that we have, I have given you will shall be fulfilled. Tonight we can have we can trust in that. Look, his disciples needed something to, to remind them, uh, something to be in front of them. Hey, he is the fulfillment. Yes. This is true. This is look, I need to be reminded all the time. What? Because I'm dumb, I guess. I need to be reminded all the time that Jesus Christ. It is coming again that I can't believe in him that his truth is truth and will happen. And I tell you, he's telling, showing his disciples all will be fulfilled. Tonight, I want you to understand it will all be fulfilled. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And righteousness doth he, he righteousness he doth judge and make war. But you understand, Jesus Christ <laughs> in Revelation chapter 19 mm. is coming again, this time to set up his kingdom. This time to make war. This time he comes riding upon a white horse with the name written on King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes. All will be fulfilled. 
Disciples, I want you to understand tonight, all will be fulfilled. This is the fulfillment of what you know to be written in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. All will be fulfilled. Number two, tonight he was teaching me, and maybe teaching the disciples, keep the truth. Keep the right way. We understand Jesus Christ is the righteous judge. He walks into the temple, the place, the house of God. Can I tell you, too many problems begin in the house of God today. Just like during that day. Too many problems, too many issues begin in the house of God. Here we have Jesus Christ comes in and he says, My house will be called the house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves and robbers. May we understand we, we will all be judged. You understand that? We will, those of us this evening that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior, we will be judged based upon whether our works were done for in the flesh or were done for him. We will be rewarded based upon that. For those that are not, that may be under the sound of my voice tonight, that have not accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, that, there will be a different judgment. And please remember, Jesus Christ, God himself, judges righteously. Yeah. It means he is right every time. That's a scary thought. That's a humbling thought. He's telling them all will be fulfilled. We must keep the truth. Keeping those in the house of God. We will all be judged. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And it was appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. We must be men and women that keep the truth, that keep that desire to be right, that make sure, especially, especially in the house of God, especially in the house of God, that we keep the truth, that we keep things right. We keep things right. Biblical. We don't use it for our gain. We don't use it for our profit. See, that's what they were doing. These men were setting up tables and they were money changers. In other words, you could you could come in and you could purchase the doves. You could purchase your offering if you didn't have one. And they were overcharging the people. They were coming to worship God. They were using it for their own gain, for their own profit. Listen, that is not that is as far away from the truth of God as you can be in the house of God. And here he came and he proclaimed he was judging righteously, judging based upon the truth, once again, of the Old Testament prophets. Notice this. Remember, I told you, he says, all will be fulfilled. Here he goes back and he says, my house should be called the house of prayer. Once again, an Old Testament fulfillment. Once again, he began healing the lame and the blind in the temple. He began doing so many marvelous works. This was in the temple that all this happened. We must keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I'm not good at eating. Actually, I'm good at eating, but I'm not good at keeping myself clean when I eat. You know, that's what a tie is for, right? It's to catch everything so it keeps your shirt clean. So you just change your tie when you go home and change it to it. I, now, today I didn't do it. For some reason, I didn't get anything on my... I was eating a salad once, and I didn't get anything. Yes, I said a salad. Um... Uh, I didn't get it, but we won't talk about all the ranch dressing on. Um, but um, uh, I, I did good. Normally, though, I got dropped here, 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 and here. Um, I'm spotted from my lunch. Can I tell you, these Pharisees, it's actually these men, these religious leaders in the temple, were carrying the world with them into the temple, not carrying Christ and the Word of God into the world. They were doing the opposite. 
See, we must keep the truth. We must protect the truth. We must defend the truth. Disciples, I'm about to leave you. And guess what? You're going to have to be men that will stand up to defend the truth. Especially in my temple that should be called the house of prayer. You're going to have to be willing to stand in front of them. Stand up for what's right, no matter what may happen to you. Remember, his mind is already a week away. His, his, as much as he is God, he is human, and his mind is already on the, the suffering and the, the, the burden he's about to bear in the crucifixion. And he's saying, no matter what, because remember, all these events are setting the stage, giving the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, giving them ammunition to go after him. And saying, look, you stand for the truth. You keep the truth, you no matter what. Disciples, you must keep the truth. Christians today, we must keep the truth, no matter what it costs. Right. Especially in the house of God. Hey. We must be willing to stand and say, that is wrong according to God's word. And defend the truth. We need men and women that are willing to stand up no matter what it costs. No matter what men and women might say. No matter what the religious authorities may say. If it's wrong, it's wrong. No matter what. Amen. We've got to be men and women willing to stand up for the truth. Disciples, you must stand up for the truth. This was highway robbery at its best in the temple. And you know, I guarantee you people thought and knew it was wrong. They knew what they were doing was wrong, but nobody was willing to stand up for the truth. And Jesus Christ walked in with righteous judgment, and he stood up for the truth. Finally tonight, have faith. Disciples, have faith. He goes out of the city during the evening. Bethany. He comes back in the next morning. As he comes back in, he, once again, nothing happens by accident. Jesus Christ knew the plant would have nothing on it. Get this. Jesus Christ already knew what was going to happen. But he did it. He allowed it to happen. He, you know, he could have very easily, when he woke up that morning, Told that fig tree to have figs on it so that he could eat it because he's hungry. Couldn't he? But instead, he wanted, he wanted to teach his disciples something about having faith. Look, Jesus Christ is about not to be with them anymore. And look, all is going to be fulfilled. I'm going to die. That is a fulfillment of scriptures. You must defend the truth. You must stand for the truth. But finally, to do all this, you must have faith. To do the things that I need you to do, that I want you to do, you must believe. You must have faith. Here, he comes in into the city, and as he sees the fig tree and leaves on it, which should be a sign that there's fruit there, and there's nothing, he curses the fig tree. And his disciples, once again, amazed. I, you know, I, I would pray that if I were living during that time and I were one of his disciples, that I would have been like, well, no doubt. Yeah, it's going to wither. Jesus Christ just cursed it. I would hope that I wouldn't be, I have marveled like they have. Especially having walked with him every day. But, once again, they marveled. Why did they marvel? Because of their lack of faith in what Jesus Christ said to do. Uh, what Jesus Christ said to that fig tree. We must have faith to do the things that, as, that, I, that I desire for you to do. Ye must have faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The substance. This verse gets all over me all the time. The substance of things hoped for. It's what gives me my hope. It's what builds my hope. My faith is what builds my hope that it's going to happen. 
It is the substance. It's what makes up my hope. And then when I'm walking by faith, it is the evidence to those around me of things not seen. My faith is evidence of things not seen. My faith, what is my faith? How is your faith today? When people see you, uh, do, do, do you have the faith that, that makes up your hope? But then do you turn around and do people see your faith and that become the evidence of what you do believe? Hebrews chapter 10 says this, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Disciples, you're about to be tested. You're about to be tried. You're about to go through things that, that, I, that you've never been through before. You're about to uh, keep my earthly ministry going. And to do all that, you must have faith that's not wavering. One day I have faith. The next day, I don't. One day, I say, I believe God's going to do it. And the next day, I say, I don't know what God's going to do. Doesn't that sound like it's some of us sometimes? I believe God can do it. I know he can. And he's going to meet this need. And praise the Lord, my faith is big. But then that next day, man, something happens. Man, I sure don't know what God can do or what God is going to do. That's way of learning faith. Wavering faith. Disciples, you must have faith. If you just have simple faith without doubt, with no doubt, you can talk to that mountain and say, be removed from the sea and it'll happen. But there's always doubt. And understand later on in chapter 11, after he's described faith, he says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Disciples, tonight I'm, he was teaching them, showing them, and he's about to go into <coughs> he's about to go into a season where he's teaching some parables, and he's going to go parable after parable after parable, trying to teach them last minute things, if you will. Try to teach all those of following him last minute things, very important things. But before he gets to that, he says, disciples, I want you to understand, all that you've heard of, all that you know of in the Old Testament will be fulfilled. There will be a sacrifice. I will be that sacrifice. Christian, do you not tonight do you believe that all, everything in God's word will be fulfilled? Yes. Amen. We must be reminded daily. We must think of this daily. What the Lord has promised will happen, will happen. It's going to happen. You can trust Him. You can, you can rest assured that what He has said will happen. Why do I know that? Because the Old Testament said it, and Jesus Christ came and did it. And guess what? He's going to come again and do it all over again. Just as the Bible says it. Secondly, tonight, though, disciples, you must stand for the truth. You must be defenders of the truth. Christians, tonight, are you defenders of the truth? Are you willing to defend the truth of the Word of God, no matter what may happen? No matter who may stand against you? No matter what the consequences? No matter who may oppose you? Are you willing to be a defender of the truth? Now, I didn't say defender of what I think to be right. I didn't say defender of, of my opinions. I said defending the word of God, Jesus Christ. What's amazing, I, even though he was king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus, God's own son, he quoted scripture to talk about what he was defending. He didn't just say, well, my opinion is you've made this a dead thing. No, he comes and he says, my house should be called a house of prayer. He backs up everything he does with scripture. Because he wants us to understand that we must defend the word of God. Yes. Not my opinion. But see, I can have many opinions. I'm very opinionated. Ask me and I'll give you my opinion. 
but I need to be more about defending God's word. Hey, standing for absolute truth. This is absolute truth. Yes. Not what I say, not what I think, but what this says is absolute truth. Christian, today, are you willing to stand for the truth? Disciples, I'm about to leave you. I'm about to leave you in charge, if you will, of everything of the ministry of my ministry that I've set up. Are you willing to defend the truth? Finally, disciples, to defend my truth, like you must, you must have faith. And it must be faith without doubt. It must be unwavering faith. Not up one day and down the next. Unwavering faith. As I was studying for this message and as God was talking to me, you know what? I was challenged by these three things. I was taken back by the fact and reminded by the fact that what God says in his word will happen. Whether I want to believe one or whether I want to say it's gonna happen or not, it, you know it does you know it used to be an old saying the saying, if the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. That used to be an old saying. That makes no sense. Because whether I believe it or not, it's gonna happen. Hey, the Bible says it, that settles it. Yes. And as you know, as I was reminded, look, the Bible says that it's gonna happen. Christian, you need to be reminded tonight that the Bible says it, that settles it. Disciples, I want to be a, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. I want to walk in his steps. That is my desire. But to do that, I've got to understand that everything in his word is going to be fulfilled. Number two, I have to be willing to stand for the truth no matter what. I need to associate myself with men and women that will stand for the truth, that will help, uh, that we can stand together to stand for the truth. That we will stand for the that we'll point out the wrong, that we'll proclaim what is wrong no matter what. We must stand for the truth. And finally, I've got to have unwavering, undoubting faith. To accomplish Christ's work here on earth, we've got to have that kind of thing. Because see, it's people around us that need to see that kind of faith. That's our ministry. That's our that's Christ's desire for my life. And maybe he gave that to me tonight just for me. I would hope that tonight maybe that challenge was needed for each and every one of us. The fact that you know there's coming a day there's coming a day that I'm going to look back. I'm going to be standing, kneeling before Christ. And we're going to look back on my life. And he's going to ask me, Did you, do you believe? Did you believe that all would be fulfilled? Keith, did you stand for the truth in my word? Did you honestly stand no matter what people would think of you? What they would say, what they might do, did you honestly stand for the truth? Keith, did you have faith? Did you have faith to just stand up and do what it called you to do? There's going to be one day where I'm going to be before Christ and he's going to ask me those questions. He's going to de desire me. Now, he already knows the answer. He does. But I'm going to have to give an answer. You're going to have to give an answer. Tonight, we've all been reminded that all will be fulfilled. But I guess my question to us tonight is, are we standing for the truth as we ought to? No matter what, we have the faith that we should have to walk with God. Unwavering, undoubted tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight. This week.